All right, welcome to Lecture 12 of the Real-Time Digital Signal Processing Lab at the University of Texas at Austin. So today we'll talk about channel impairments and channel models, and we'll see that a really good channel model for getting started with a communication system or an unknown, any unknown system where you're trying to get data from one, one place to another is a, a, a filter, a linear time invariant filter, plus additive noise, plus a possible scaling terms. It's a very simple model, but it works over a wide variety of scenarios. So we'll talk about a few things today. We'll talk about analog communication systems, analog continuous time communication channels, or any other transmission medium, channel impairments, and if we have time, we'll get the hybrid communication systems. The analog pulse amplitude modulation are optional slides. So back to way back in lecture zero slides, we had this block diagram, and it's we're going to come up several times again for the rest of the semester. So very high level abstract block diagram for a communication system. So just to review, uh, we have information sources, it could be voice, music, images, video, and data. These are base band signals. Again, energy concentrated around zero frequency. They may or may not include zero frequency or zero frequency may or may not be relevant. So in audio, we don't hear zero frequency, for example. The transmitter is going to have a couple of uh, blocks to it. We've got, at the very basic uh, level here, we've got signal processing block, at the very least, some low-pass filtering. We have a signal processing block in the transmitter. We have a carrier circuits block in the transmitter. And it says carrier circuits, and in fact, almost all these operations could be performed in discrete time. And digital, and we have just a few, but important analog components at the end. Uh, a mixed signal component for D to A conversion, power amp, antenna, and so forth. So there's a few very important. So you could put a lot of the work here in digital and discrete time. Anyway, so our carrier circuits are going to really upconvert a baseband signal to band, to band pass to enforce a transmission band. So in general, in communication systems, our transmission is band pass. It's pretty unusual to use DC as part of our transmission medium. It can happen, but it's unusual um, in, in many cases. I'm trying to think of one where we do, and we, you know, probably take, it'll probably come to me at the end. But the most thing that we do is actually a bandpass data transmission. Now, the transmission medium could be many things. It could be wired line, could be twisted pair, coaxial cable. Fiber optics could be wireless, indoor, outdoor, through the air, underwater, space, deep space, for example. And these transmission media have, although they're very different in terms of physical materials and how, and you could argue how waves propagate through them, there are some commonalities among, among these different media. And we'll talk about that in just a couple of slides. And there's some models that we can use for any of that really works for all of these as a starting point. So a few questions. A twisted pair, uh, this would be you know, a pair of copper wires, usually thinly shielded. Could be in the home, could be local neighborhood. That's how DSL would work over it, home wiring to some extent. Uh, what kind of bandwidth do you think you can get out of just kind of weakly shielded copper pairs? Where do you think the upper bandwidth is? Useful bandwidth. You can throw out some guesses. It's OK. What's that? A couple gigahertz? A couple gigahertz? gigahertz? Yeah, gigahertz would be tough out of twisted pair. I mean, my, 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 yeah, it'd be pretty tough. Uh, so this bandwidth is up to about 20 megahertz, roughly. I mean, you could probably push it a little bit higher, but in turn, you get useful stuff where you're doing more than one, you know, more than just one bit signaling. Uh, this would be DSL, for example, would be in this range. Coaxial cable, now we've got good shielding. Right, we've got good thick outer insulation. We've got a sheath and a central uh, carrier. What's the, so a lot better shielding. What's your guess at the upper bandwidth here for use? It's almost a gigahertz. I'll put it at about 400 megahertz and that, you know, there are probably people that have pushed this way above that, but a gigahertz I think would might be doable, but I know that up to about 400 gigahertz. So I will, I'll go 360 to be a little bit more uh, conservative. So this would be cable modems. 
And then fiber is, you know, it's pretty amazing. Go ahead. Yeah, basically the attenuation is so great at, at higher frequencies above this that you're buried in the noise. It's hard to get a signal through. Okay, now over the air, a little more flexibility. Now over the air, we can use whatever we can use and, and whatever we can build, basically. And whatever, now we have to be careful about using unlicensed, you know, whether we're using a licensed or unlicensed band, but we're doing transmission at 60 gigahertz and above. Right, so there's amazing opportunities, right, indoor and over the air, or even outdoor over the air. Outdoor over the air is, you know, more amazing. In indoor, the problem is getting signal from outside to inside. There's loss in the windows and the walls and so forth, 20 dB or so. You lose quite a bit coming through a building. So it's tough, tough for getting a signal that originates from outside a building to inside. Uh, so it's better to have the signals, you know, generated from inside the building. Um, underwater depends on the on the medium, but for acoustic transmissions, um, depends on the distance. You might be limited to basically audible frequencies, you know, a little bit above that, so you can basically up to you can actually up to one megahertz at short range. But at short range here, meaning in like less than 100 meters, if you go for like a kilometer or more, you're down in the below 100 kilohertz range. Okay, so lots of different possible bandwidths here. Again, with the most flexibility going to the uh, over-the-air case. What is, what is common is that propagating signals in all these cases are going to degrade with distance. Now, the amount of de degradation or loss varies with the medium, for example. Um, the loss is pretty severe underwater. What about space? For space, um, I don't know it offhand. I know that uh, there's a GPS band at one point. There's a number of GPS bands. One's at 1.5 gig, 1.9 gig gigahertz. That's for you know from satellite to, to ground. Uh, for deep space, I don't know. Don't know the the frequency. Okay. So in any case, the propagating signals are going to degrade over distance, and so we're going to have to deal with this. We're going to have to uh, somehow adapt in our receiver and possibly in the transmitter to, to handle this. We want to be able to make sure we get a good signal from transmitter to receiver. Another option is to put up repeaters, and we've talked about this before. Um, the repeaters are uh, other products or devices in, in the space to help you amplify the signal. So we use this a lot in cellular. We have uh, Pico cells mounted at a lamp post to serve a street or two. We have femtocells or small cells in the home to service the home environment. Uh, so these are basically repeaters that help the, the base station, the macrocell base station, the one that are you know, tower mounted, um, to reach you. Okay, so we do this in cellular to handle dead spots or, or urban canyons, other dead zones. So this is pretty common in cellular uh, today. All right, so let's talk about some impairments. Now, the, again, what's, oh, I should back up a little bit. I didn't quite do the receiver. So the receiver's got a lot of work to do. Now in this block diagram, it looks like the receiver has the same amount of work to do as the transmitter. Uh, problem is, no, it has a lot more work to do than the, than the transmitter. Generally speaking, if I want a two-way uh, communication system to work here, the receiver, yes, in principle, uh, has, again, the similar blocks of carrier circuits, which would do down conversion from bandpass to baseband and some signal processing step to reduce noise, extract the message signal, enhance the message signal. But it's got a lot of work to do because the receiver, if, especially if we have synchronization in time between transmitter and receiver, the receiver has to find out what, the, what that time is, what, how to synchronize time, uh, both in terms of uh, sampling rate and sampling offset, frequency, carrier frequency and phase, and has to account for distortion in the transmission medium and the analog front ends for doing the baseband work. So a lot of work to do with the receiver, a lot of adaptive systems, a lot more work, two to three X, four X more than the transmitter. A transmitter has some work to do too, and there's some adaptive systems in the transmitter. Um, there, there's usually some sort of echo cancellation at the interface between the transmitter output and the transmission medium. Uh, there may be other echo cancellers wherever you have an interface uh, Two, two wires coming together just from impedance mismatch, you can get reflections. So there are adaptive systems in the transmitter, 
but the bulk of the of the processing is going to be in your receiver for a data communication system, a high speed data communication system. So we'll spend the next five weeks or so of class dealing with the adjustments in the receiver. There'll be homeworks four through eight, the next five homeworks. A lot to do. Now, why? So let's talk about the you know, so a lot of impairments that we have to account for, and we can use both the transmitter and the receiver to help us over, you know, overcome these impairments. But let's talk about what some of those impairments are first. First of all, so if we have in the wireline channel and also in the analog front ends, we also have some impairments. Let's talk about the wireline channel for a minute. The wireline is a good place to start. This would be a wire, either copper, you know, twisted pair or, or coaxial wire. So we have linear time invariant effects, and we have a pretty good handle on those now. That's you know from signals and systems and from earlier in the class. So what happens in terms of physical uh, effects or phenomenon is that we have attenuation of a transmitted signal over this medium. This is going to be dependent on the channel frequency response. Some frequencies pass through pretty much unchanged. Some get it rejected completely. Some are attenuated strongly. So there's a frequency-dependent response. We have a good handle on this. This is just the, the frequency response of the LTI part of the channel. And so we have some frequencies are in the pass band, and some are in the stop band. That's in the frequency domain. In the time domain, we know that since we have an LTI model here, that any input signal that goes through our communication channel, and this is just in general an unknown channel, so for the LTI part of this unknown channel, the input is going to convolve with the impulse response of the LTI part of the channel, which means that in the time domain, we're going to get spreading due to convolution. Right, so we're going to have spreading due to convolution. So we have two effects to worry about. One is spreading in time. We'll talk about why that's a problem in a second. And then some frequencies just don't get through. So to be careful, we don't want to. We want to make sure that when we transmit information, we don't want to put all that message information from the transmitter into just one frequency because it might not get through. Right. So an application that we've talked about already is to scramble. For example, if they have a long strings of zeros or ones to transmit, uh, a long string of zeros, uh, bits of zero, we'd like to make sure that that doesn't map to DC. It's just one frequency in our message, which becomes the carrier frequency after up conversion. We want to instead spread that out over many, many frequencies. So it's more likely for the transmission to get through the channel. All right, so let's go back to a um, simple case here. So here I just want to send a bit, either bit of value 0 or bit of value 1. This is a digital piece of information. And the problem is that my channel is analog in continuous time. I can't send a discrete time digital signal over that. I have to convert it to analog in continuous time. One way to do that is to use pulse amplitude modulation. That's all this is. This is a very simple case of two-level pulse amplitude modulation. So I have a bit of value 0, and I'm going to map this to uh, a pulse shape that's a rectangular pulse with Amplitude, well, minus capital A, and a bit of value 1 whose amplitude is positive capital, well, capital A, and A could be positive or negative, quite honestly. I've drawn capital A here to be positive. So the receiver wants to know, you know, which, ultimately, which bit was sent. So it's going to have to make a, an educated guess, hopefully not by flipping a coin. We can do better than that, usually. Okay, so we want to be able to figure this out. So on the receiver end, what's going to happen? If I send a bit of value 0, which again is this rectangular pulse of, of non-positive amplitude, over this communication channel. Now I have to model the communication channel, and we'll talk a bit in a few minutes why this model makes sense. But we can model the communication channel as an LTI system with a finite duration impulse response, that is, as an FIR filter. Now, physically, the communication channels are going to have, or these channels are going to have an infinite impulse response. But we're going to model, and I'll show you how in a second, as an FIR response. 
And just for simplicity, I'm going to model the, the effective duration of the channel as T capital T sub H, which is in seconds, and that the area here of the impulse response matches the area of the actual physical impulse response. There's a modeling step here. All right, so if we have a, if this model is legitimate, this FIR filter model is legitimate, then what's going to happen is that in transmission, at least for the LTI part of the channel, the convolution of my transmitted waveform, this negative or non-positive rectangular pulse, is convolved with the impulse response of the channel. So the convolution of these two rectangular pulses gives me a trapezoid. I hinted at this earlier in the semester as being an important convolution to, to remember and recall. And you'll notice that the convolution result, as you'd expect from convolving two finite length signals, gets wider. So now the received signal is not, first of all, it's spread out in time. And it's also experienced attenuation in terms of frequency. So we know that, uh, so in the time domain, I can involve a rectangular pulse with a rectangular pulse. I get a trapezoid. The trapezoid is, is equal to the length of the two, the sum of the lengths of the two rectangular pulses. So it's the length of the transmitted rectangular pulse, capital T sub B, and the length of the channel impulse response, capital T sub H. If I send a bit of value 1, it looks pretty similar. Send a bit of value 1. I'm going to use now a rectangular pulse that is of non-negative amplitude, goes through the same channel. I get a trapezoid now of non-negative values, and I end up, again, it's still spread in the same way in the time domain. In the frequency domain, what's happening? I'm filtering, right? It's a filtering operation, so, in the, so I'm basically filtering the uh, transmitted waveform with the frequency response of the channel. What is the frequency response of the channel? The sync, so some frequencies don't get through. Some frequencies get eliminated, some frequencies are in the pass band, some are in the stop band. And there's also a transition band, right, between pass band and stop band. Okay, so some frequencies get through, some don't get through at all, some get attenuated, some get passed uh, as strong as they were coming in. Okay, so now the next question is okay, fine, I've got this receiver has to now deal with the received waveform, how does the receiver figure out what bit was transmitted? What would you do? I still don't know what yet. Hang on. So a suggestion is to take an average value over some range of, of time and compare it against the threshold, yes. That's a pretty good approach. Um, what range of, sec of time would you like to average over? Time of a bit, so T sub B, right? And where would you start? Because I have lots of options here, right? I've got all kinds of options. And so where would you start? Yeah, like, isn't the, how would you synchronize the input and output? Yeah, we're assuming that we're already synchronized, which is nice. So that's already been done for you. We will synchronize later, but textbooks love to just say, oh, we're going to synchronize. And they say, oh, it's not a big deal. No, it's a big deal. This is a big problem. All right. the, let's assume that we're synchronized. The output we'll, is, the output's a longer signal. Though. That's right. The output's a longer signal. And there's a delay. What's the delay through the filter? T of H. T of H. And then what's the group delay? What's the group delay through the communication channel? Oh, we're in seconds. We have a symmetric impulse response about the origin. It's half the half of th, right? So another, so you could say, okay, I can throw out the group delay and then average, or I could do worst case and throw out the first capital T sub h seconds and then average the rest from t sub h to t sub h plus t sub b, right? But the averaging is the right answer, and it turns out that that is an extremely. In fact, it, we'll show later that that's the best thing you could do. That is the optimal answer, best possible answer in terms of signal to noise ratio. Uh, that you can do in the presence of noise. Okay, so I need to pick some interval of time that's T sub B long, and I want to average over that and compare against the threshold. So if I, what threshold would you like to use here for the bit of value zero? I feel like zero would be good, so we can do it higher. Well, actually zero is pretty good. So if they're equally likely, zero is your, and we'll get to this later, zero is the best choice. 
So if I average the values and then is it less or greater than zero? Less than or greater than zero? Less than zero. So if I average the values for uh, the bit duration from capital T sub H to capital T sub H plus T capital T sub B, and I compare it against zero. If it's less than zero, I have a bit of value zero. If it's greater than zero, I have a bit of value one. Extremely useful approach. What happens if I get exactly zero? I average over that duration, T capital T sub B, and my answer is exactly zero. You could, well, yes, basically you don't know. If, it's, if, if, if the average is zero, you don't know, you don't have, and now you, it's a guess. That so you, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's extraordinarily rare. But just to, for completeness, if it is zero, then I gotta come up with an answer. I can explain the difference between, between a Right, so you could decide to, right, so you could decide that if your threshold is zero, then I just pick the previous bit. Or I can flip a coin. Because once the average is zero, you don't know. You don't know which one it is with any certainty. They're equally likely at that point. You don't know. So the problem here is, is it that there's noise? Or that no, there's no noise in this particular yeah. problem, but when we add noise, it. right, so without noise, we don't even need the average. Without noise, I can pick, you know, pick a point. Right? If without noise, I can just pick a point, and I'm pretty pretty confident. Right? As long as I pick a point in the plateau, or in this case, I guess the valley, uh, I'm great. Okay. But now once I add noise to this, then I want to average. That's the best thing I can do given this pulse shape. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so that's the model. Let's talk about why this model is where it comes from. We use this model a lot in practice. And it, it's a pretty good one. All right, so let's talk about the two. So I'll give you the wireline case here, so we'll talk about that. So the wireline case, if you think about wire with, you know, copper pair, twisted pair, I have typically ground and, and uh, the other wire, usually to differential signaling in general. I'm going through a wire. This wire has resistance, inductance, capacitance in the wiring. You can model, if it's a long wire, you can model, I suppose, the second order sections. So basically what this, the impulse response would look like from a twisted pair or even uh, coaxial cable is something that looks like an RLC response. So in DSL, for example, we've done measurements in my group, and I'll uh, give you an example DSL channel that we've seen. Okay, so here's an impulse response that we've measured. Now it's going to die out. Now this, the nice thing is it's RLC response, so we're expecting a dampened response, dampened sinusoid, second order system, exponential times a cosine with a possible phase shift. So this continues on and eventually you know, reaches zero as in the limit as time goes to infinity. But at some point you just say, you know, we can just truncate this. And it's good enough. Eventually it dies out so much we... we don't really care. Now we can, so we can, just to sound familiar, we can eyeball it and say, okay, you know, the response is good enough here, right? So at this, at this point, we're just going to call the, the impulse response zero. It's already gone low enough that we're just going to call it zero after uh, capital T sub H. So now I model this, even though it's an infinite long impulse response. We're going to model it as a finite length impulse response. And the next step is to figure out what's the amplitude. So if we're going to model this as a rectangular pulse, I need to know two things. I need to know, because I really want to match ultimately the, the area here. So here's my model. I'll call it H hat of T, I suppose. We'll make it capital T sub H long. And then I have to figure out, well, it's there's a certain height there, right? And I have to figure out what's how would you figure out what that height is? Yeah. 
This should sound familiar from earlier in the semester. Did we do something like this? Energy of the two. Remember we did this for power bandwidth. So we did this in the frequency domain, but we can apply the same idea in the time domain. I want to find the amplitude so that the area in absolute value sense or absolute value squared if you want is the same. So I could be mathematical about it and say, if I take the absolute value of h of t and I square it, there's an energy. Right, so if I square h of t, the absolute value, and I look at how much energy is there, I want to match the energy. So I pick this amplitude where the question mark is called a sub h. And what we really want to have is the, the area. So we do the area, for example. So we could say, for example, pick, uh, we want to pick the product. Right, that's the area to be equal to the area under all of the impulse response. And we want to match uh, area, or we could match area in the absolute value sense, or we could match energy, which would be the absolute value squared. Or I can match 90%, or pick an pick a arbitrary value. Right, so we do this in, uh, in practice. FIR filters are much e easier to work with than IR filters for lots of reasons. Stability is one, but just not to worry about an infinitely long impulse response. Pretty good. Now it turns out we can do the same modeling for a wireless channel, and I guess I'll wait till we get to the wireless part for that. But for the wireless channel, we'll see that we can get a, a similar model. There are other impairments in a wired communication system, and all the impairments we talk about for the wired case, the wireline case, uh, apply to the wireless case. And there's some additional issues with wireless as well. All right, so here's, uh, so we have now linear time varying effects in the wireline case. And this means now that the, the frequency response will vary with time. So one thing you can, so one way to see this, if I were to put a sinusoid in, so one, one artifact here is called phase jitter. This is, a, this is a problem. So in phase jitter, if we put in a sinusoid at a fixed frequency through this communication channel, or unknown channel, it doesn't have to be a communication channel, this unknown channel, it will experience different phase shifts over time. So, I, so in other words, I put in a cosine fixed frequency through my, through my channel. And what comes out is the same cosine plus a time varying phase. So the frequency gets through, but the phase shift varies a little bit with time. Now, Okay, so is this a problem? Well, we're going to use the phase to carry message data in our communication system. So it is important that we adjust to time varying phase. Okay, so there are a couple of ways. One is to figure out how bad is it, how do we measure it, and the second is how do we compensate for it. So we'll talk about how to measure it right now. We'll compensate it later when we talk about phase lock loops. Okay, so we'll do that. The conversation will come later. Let's talk about the impairment right now. Okay, so if I were to plot this cosine as a function of, of time and the phase was slowly varying, it's possible that it would be hard to see. Okay, so if I were just to plot the cosine, you know, as best I can, you know, so here's a, my best, yeah, I can do better than that. Anyway, it's good enough, I guess, for hand drawing. Now, it's possible that there is a slight variation beyond my hand jitter, I suppose. 
Uh, but it's hard to see if you just plot it over all time. But, but there's a trick. And the trick is, for any periodic waveform, you can see the phase shift with time if you plot one period and then restart the plot and plot the next period over the first one, plot the third period over the first one, the fourth period over the first one. And then what you'll see over time is the buildup of this phase shift. So let me show you an example of that plot. And the, more, the fancier term for this is called an eye diagram. It can be used for any periodic signal, not just a cosine. It can be anything. An eye diagram, like a human eye. But let me, let me first let me do the cosine. So if I plot the cosine, again, I just want to plot over one period. So there's my end of a period. So EYE diagram. Okay, so now here's the cosine. So if, if everything is great with my cosine to the, to the resolution of my hand drawing, and I plot and there were no phase shift at all, zero all the time, it would just look like this all the time. If I had absolutely no phase offset or phase jitter with time, it would just it would look great. Now, if, I, if my phase, though, is not zero, then what I'll see is I'll plot this. Now, I'll plot the second period, and it, you know, if it were periodic, truly without a time varying phase, we would just get this plot over and over again, but we'll see if the phase is a little bit off, we'll start seeing this. And then this will come back around underneath the red, and then maybe the phase speeds up again, and then maybe it comes back around and maybe it slows down. So what I'll see is these curves superimposed, and now I can get an experimental measurement of the jitter. Again, if the phase were zero, I would have had the red, the red one, which is maybe hard to see now, but here's, here's the piece of my red one. All right, I would have had the red one. And what you see otherwise is the, is the jitter with respect to that first one. A better way to go after jitter is to figure out, well, what's the average? So if I look at the color I can see here, okay. I look at a zero crossing, and I know that this, this jitter basically jiggles the, the zero crossing. So I can characterize this jitter by saying there's an average value through that zero crossing, and that crossing hits the right place plus or minus some error, if you will. And so this will characterize in measurements how, how far I am that it's off. Okay, so that's a, that we can do this with any periodic waveform. Extremely useful. Go ahead. In this case, I'm just plotting it over and over again. I'm not doing anything else. I'm not expecting. The only thing I'm expecting is I'm expecting some knowledge. I'm expecting that I know what I have a notion of what the period should be. That is to say, I have a notion of what the frequency of that sinusoid should be. It should be one over FC. Right? So I have a. The only thing I have here is I have some knowledge or estimate of the carrier of the of the period, right, which is one over the frequency, right? That's all that I know. And it doesn't matter where so I can measure this at the transmitter output in the receiver. I can measure this at different places. Go ahead. Can we move something in the eye diagram? Yeah, I'm gonna give you the eye next. We're, this is half the eye. I'll draw you the rest of the eye in a second. So this is plotting the cosine as a function of you know just Whatever the received value is here as a function of time, but I do one period and I superimpose one period, superimpose. Okay, and eventually we'll see that this won't, you know, we'll see the wiggle, if you will, and the amount of phase jitter. How do we get an eye out of this, a human eye or something that looks like it? Is what I'll do is I'll plot, here's a plot of, and this is the plot of the cosine over time with a phase, time varying phase. The way I get an eye diagram is if I plot the negative of that, 
trying to think I should do it on the same plot. I'll do it on the same plot. Okay, let me see if this color works, and if not, that's fine. Does that work? Sort of? Okay. All right. Sort of. All right, if I plot the negative of all these curves, let's say I plot the negative of the red, and now I plot the negative of the, of the, of the black curves as best I can here. So now I'm plotting, this is now the negative, that point is the negative cosine 2 pi fc t plus, it's the negative of that. Now it turns out, now I look at this as best I've drawn it. So this, this lobe here, you know, we say it's an eye diagram, right? So that's an eye, and if the eye is open, we have a pretty good signal. If we have lots of phase jitter, and we also can plot, there's also possibly noise here. As this eye, if this eye closes, it means we have a very poor signal. So it's an empirical measure of signal quality that you can use in the lab at any point in the system. Transmitter, receiver, and even in the channel if you wish. And you can have your oscilloscopes sweep this out for you. Put it in a periodic mode and just let it superimpose. It's a nice troubleshooting method uh, in continuous time analog. You can also do it in MATLAB in discrete time digital. You can do it at the baseband. Discrete time digital, you can do it in continuous time analog. This is just a great tool to know. So your transmitter should have a pretty good looking eye diagram. Or you've messed up your transmitter. So it's a nice debugging tool. So this is the this is the part here of visualizing the phase jitter. Now there's some other issues that happen. We've got harmonics, we've got all kinds of stuff happening. And we'll talk more about those a little bit later. We're not going to model those here in this in this set of slides, but just to realize there are some nonlinear effects. And they can be quite significant. What we will model today in this set of slides is additive noise. Right? Just from the Nothing else from thermal noise, random motion of electrons due to temperature. And, we're, and this additive noise will be throughout the system, transmitter, channel, and receiver. Now, we've talked about additive interference. This can arise from systems operating in the transmission band. We've had homework on this. We had a midterm question on this. And again, for additive interference, it's narrow band. We can go after it with a uh, notch filter. It's one way to go after it. But again, that will not be in the model we developed today. But these are just other, so you know, any model is incomplete. And so if we start, we want to start with something that's simple and easy to use. And a good starting point is modeling the channel as an FIR filter and additive noise. It goes a long way. And making sure your, your system works correctly with that simple channel model and then add in other impairments once you're pretty confident you can at least handle an FIR effect and additive noise. Good. So, are we assuming that the phase generation is always a linear function, or is it no? No, this is a random. You can think of this uh, phase function of, with respect to time, this phi, of, this theta of t, as really being uh, random. If you wish, we can model it as a you know pick pick your favorite distribution. It could be Gaussian, it could be uniformly distributed. What we like to know is we'd like to measure it as opposed to imposing a particular distribution on it. Right. Now we could we could model with an eye diagram and then even go f or even just plot it, you know, every period superimposed on the other periods. And we could if we really needed to do that, we could estimate if we wanted to say impose a Gaussian model on this with the mean and the variance, we could estimate the mean and the variance from the plot. But we, we won't in this class we won't go that far. With with taking measurements and then fitting it to a, a distribution. But it's something we could do, and we do. We could do it. All right, so let me give you a, an example of measuring noise and to see how complicated this can get. 
Um, so here is a measurement that was taken, I guess, almost three years ago to the day. And this was done in an apartment in, in Austin. And this was measuring simply what's going on out of your power plug. What's going on in the power line without, any, without transmitting anything, just listening. Right? How much noise and other you know, sources of distortion and, and degradation are out there. So this is what we measure. So this is a, over a band from 0 to 90 kilohertz. And as you may recall from midterm one, this is, a, this is part of the, a band that we could use for power line communications for smart grid, for example. And that, although that communication would typically happen on outdoor power lines, not inside the home power lines. But nonetheless, what happens inside the home can affect outside. <coughs> Excuse me. So the transmission band that we would care about in uh, certain power line communication standards is this one. It's from 40 to 90. That's what we had in the midterm. There are other standards that start down at 3 kilohertz and go out to 500 kilohertz. Just depends on whether, you know, in the U.S. we go from 3 to 500. Uh, in, that's the FCC band. There is a European band. Uh, I think this is Centelec A. This is the 40 to 90. Anyway, so it's interesting to see what happens here because it's pretty complicated. Again, we're not transmitting anything. We're just listening to what's going on over this range of frequencies that we might use in the future for transmission. And you'll notice lots of things, right? You'll Probably you can pick out a few features. Where's the thermal noise? Everywhere. Everywhere. Where can you see the thermal noise? That's a good answer. Where can you see the thermal noise? On the high end of the spectrum. So you can see the thermal noise right here. So here, the thermal noise is easy to see. You're right, it's at all frequencies. And you can see it. I mean, it's, it's wiggling around at all frequencies. Right? I also have some narrowband interference. I have lots of these, these spikes that are seen. I mean, this is a plot in the frequency domain. So you see lots of these narrowband interferers that are showing up. Okay? So some of them are harmonically, are harmonics generated from um, switching power supplies. They're asynchronous to the power line frequency, and they're in the 20 to 100 kilohertz range. Okay, so let's go a little deeper. So you can, the way that um, folks tend to model this, not the only way, which is to have a, basically a spectrally shaped background noise, kind of falls at the rate of e to the minus. So this, this one falls off e to the minus some function of time. Uh, oh, frequency, sorry. All right, some exponential decay with frequency. And there's a scalar, I mean, in front of this. Okay, so that's one part of the spectrum. There's also narrowband interference, which we've talked about. And again, if, if there's any harmonic structure, it's probably from a switching mode power supply or more than one. And there's also other interference. Sometimes AM radio bands will, will leak down into this range. They're not in this range, but they may alias down into this range. These wires are really nice antennas in the home, also outdoor. We have this happening. Okay, so the, the modeling here is fairly complicated here. So the full model would have all these sources of distortion. I'd have some sort of LTI distortion. I'd have additive thermal noise. I'd have narrowband interferers. Right. And, and this is now my, this exponential decay would be the frequency response of my FIR filter. Okay, so pretty complicated. But before we get to it, so if you were to try, try out a system in simulation, we don't want to go for the whole complicated story right away. Start simple and then get more complicated. Make sure that the system works over the simple models first. Okay. And so here is the, the simplest model, and it applies for both wired and wireless, is the one down here at the bottom. All right. So our, this is a really good model to use, we have, again, if we look at how this impacts the wired case, we have the FIR filter, 
which models the frequency distortion in the LTI component of the channel. We have additive noise that at least captures the thermal noise in the system. This is, uh, this is a channel model, but so it's really an aggregate noise model for the whole channel. And that's, that would where we would stop for the wired case. That's enough. For the wireless case, we take it one step farther and add a gain here that is time, possibly time varying. And this would account for fading, uh, signal fading in and out. <coughs> we experience this when talking on the phone quite a bit. So again, so back to, so wireless channel impairments are going to be the same as the wireline channel impairments plus some others. And one of them is fading. And fading is basically multiplicative noise. It's a attenuation, low or high over time. And we can represent this as a time varying gain that follows a particular distribution and it depends on the wireless scenario what that distribution is. Okay, so here's the simplified channel model that includes fading, LTI effects, and additive noise. Pretty simple to simulate in MATLAB in discrete time. All right, so it's just a gain, and we might have to update the A naught every so many milliseconds or something to follow a distribution to be really, it's in the wireless case. The wired case, the gain's one. The rest of it, FI or filter. Use the filter commands in MATLAB. And then add noise. It's a very simple channel model, and it covers an awful lot of possibilities. All right. Let me end up today's lecture by saying why the FIR filter is useful in the wireless case. Why is this a useful model for a channel impulse response? Go ahead. Correct. So in practice, the, the, channel, the channel response, all the degradation in the channel is not going to grow without bound. It's a physical channel. Its, it's response in amplitude in the time domain cannot grow without bound with time. It doesn't make sense physically to have unbounded amplitude, which means unbounded power, unbounded energy. It doesn't make any sense physically. So it's another advantage of the FIR filter. We don't have to worry about stability, FIBO stability. Okay. Let's talk about why this is useful in uh, wireless. Why is the FIR filter uh, approximation useful? All right, so let's talk about transmitter. Wireless media and receiver. Okay, think about audio as a fine example, uh, just audible frequencies is fine to, to think about here. So as I'm talking to you, there's a direct line from my, from the pressure waves out of my mouth to you. There's a direct line of sight to you. There's also a route that bounces off the ceiling to you. There's another route that might bounce off a wall to you. That's one bounce. There's another route that has two bounces to you. It might be table, ceiling to you. And there's three bounces and four bounces. All these bounces that can get to you. So if I were to transmit an impulsive event, a really you know, a noise that's for a very short period of time, less than probably millisecond, really short in time, then what will happen is, so if my transmit were, in theory, we're just going to go ahead and use an, I'll, let me use a short pulse to be more realistic. So my transmitted signal is a short pulse goes over an acoustic channel. I have the line of sight, but there's some delay to get there, right? There's some delay based on the speed of propagation in the environment. I then have a number of these one bounce and they'll take longer to get there, right? The path length is longer. Assuming that the speed of propagation is the same throughout the medium, then this bounce will take longer to get to the receiver. I may also have a case of multiple bounces, or more than one. So there's the two bounce path to the receiver. Okay. And now if I were to plot what I receive 
over time, what does it look like? How would you describe it in words? It'd be what? Oh, well, this is just a rectangular pulse, and then I'm going to send zero. I'm not going to send it periodically. Oh. I'm just, bam, impulsive, or a very short burst of energy, right? So the sum of pulses would be a phase shift. Sum of pulses with a phase shift, but I'm assume. well, I'm also going to assume that, it, that this path takes a while. So this, the line of sight, the, the time for the line of sight is a lot, lot longer than the duration of the pulse, okay? It's going to be train of pulses. So I initially have the first pulse, and really it's going to get spread a little bit in time. So let me draw that in. So I got a little spreading. And that, that point right here is the propagation time. There's a delay. For line of sight. And then all the one bounce, right, which is going to, they're going to come in at different times. Because right? I can bounce off the ceiling once, I can bounce off the wall once. Right, and the path may have a little bit, it will change a little bit based on the angle. Right? So I get a bunch of these that happen, and they may add up constructively, destructively. The second bounce may be a little bit larger than the first, than the third, the ones with two bounces. And then, again, these are not uniformly spaced in time, et cetera, right? So I get all these bounces that come back to me. Now, if I look at what an impulse response looks like, well, I get an impulse, really, if I, if I were to really make this an impulse, direct delta, then I'd get the line of sight path and then each of the bounces. And the impulse response I get the first impulse at T naught. I get a bunch of impulses that are clustered together for the first bounce. A bunch of impulses clustered together for the second bounce, all the second bounce cases, and so forth. And again, these are not uniformly spaced impulses. But eventually, what's going to happen? Eventually, the area under these direct deltas will decay with time. I lose more energy after I hit the medium and bounce. And so eventually these areas will, will, will die out as time goes to infinity, and we truncate the impulse response there. And we assume that it's a finite length, and we can pick the FIR filter again to match the energy in the impulse response. Go ahead. No, this would be direct delta. So I, you know, the, the so I've kind of misled the areas here. So you, let me draw this a little bit better. So up here, so the first the first bounce can actually add up to be higher than the direct line of sight because there are many first bounces, but eventually you you die out in amplitude, and then eventually, you know, it, it dies out to the point where you say it's enough. We're just going to not the rest is negligible in terms of return energy or the energy that gets from me to you. So if we get up to like 10 bounces, I don't think there's really much to worry about. 1,000 bounces, no. Because I can, I, I, I can bounce off a table, hit a ceiling, hit the back wall to you. I mean, there are all kinds of ways to bounce to you, but eventually the energy will, will die out with enough bounces. So it's like echoes. Yeah, there isn't, right. That's right, so eventually the echoes die out. Okay. They can overlap, it's okay, it won't bother us. Because in the end, we care about how long is it, right? How long is it? Yes, yeah, you can get destructive interference, exactly. But again, we're just justifying why an FIR model makes sense. Okay, thank you, we'll see you next time.